Hello, everybody. Lovely to see you all again. Um, welcome to this EpiWin webinar on vaccine safety monitoring. It really is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Madava, a colleague of ours who specializes in pharmacovigilance and has been monitoring um, the vaccine safety aspect of the COVID work. And so it is really our pleasure to have Dr. Madav with us here today on this webinar. Um, I know that some folks are still joining, but um, we don't want to go over time too much. And so I suggest now that we begin the webinar. So welcome to everybody who's joined. Uh, once again, a quick reminder, if you do have questions, please do put them in the Q&A um, function rather than the chat. And we will try to have time at the end of this webinar to answer some of these questions. We also have interpretation into French. So if you prefer to listen in French, then please feel free to switch to that channel. And um, as is normal with our webinars, we are streaming live to YouTube. So we should be able to uh, share the link for that recording afterwards. You will be able to find the recording there. And also we will be able to share a, cop a copy of the slides that Dr. Madav is going to present. And so without any further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Madav and hand over to you for the presentation. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, all uh, friends uh, 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 and uh, colleagues who are present all over the world. First of all, a good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening to everyone. I'm, as uh, Sarah just introduced me, I'm working here in the vaccine safety team, uh, in the pharmacovigilance team, actually, to be precise. In WHO headquarters, I've been here for the last uh, 10 years in headquarters itself. So today we are going to be talking about uh, uh, vaccine safety, uh, monitoring of vaccine safety uh, of, uh, you know, with COVID-19 vaccines. Now this has become a very, very important topic, uh, particularly where, uh, considering the fact uh, that we recently had some events which, which, are of, um, quite of, uh, which are quite concerning. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to try to make this simple because I was kind of informed that this uh, the target audience for this uh, seminar are people with a heterogeneous background and it is very important for trying to keep this as basic as possible. So what I'm going to be doing is, I'm, if you just look at my slides, I have arranged it in a very uh, simple manner in the sense, I, it is very practical. Like we are going to be looking at it step by step and also from a very hands-on perspective. Like if I am going to be affected, what should I do? So those are the kind of questions which we are going to be dealing with. Now, the that is the first part of my talk. The second part of my talk, I'm actually, you must have heard about the Global Advisory Committee meeting, which took place last week on the 13th of uh, April. So I'm also going to show you some technical slides on that. That is when I'm going to enter into some of the technical areas where the language will be a little bit more difficult, but I will try to again simplify it so that uh, I, it is made, it's in a more distilled fashion for the other audience. So without much ado, let me just start off by sharing my screen. So Judith, please let me know if you're able to see it. I see it fine. Wonderful, excellent. So let me then start the, the, uh, this uh, webinar. Now, as far as we are concerned, we should, uh, before I go into the details, I would just first of all like to set the stage. Where are we right now, particularly with regard to the COVID pandemic? So I'm going to be talking about the current global situation and how to monitor the vaccine safety. I'm also going to go into this uh, technical component, what I just told you now on the GACS statement, that is the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Statement. I'm also going to talk very, I mean, we are going to have one slide on the traditional COVID protection measures, of course, which is very important. So let us look at the global situation. Why are we all worried right now? We are worried right now because as you see, this slide was taken less than 24 hours back from the WHO website, which it will and like yesterday. And if you see the, the curve, I mean, the epidemic curve is going up. We have got more than 140 million cases and more than 3 million deaths. So this is definitely worrying. 
And the, where did where and then people ask us this question? Okay, where do I get this particular information? So if you just click on this particular link, which we are going to be sharing with you, you'll be able to enter into the WHO website, which kind of gives you quite a lot of information on where we are. So this is where I got my data from. So you can actually look at this particular data, and you will see that throughout the world, the number of cases are increasing. And as you will see, we are most of the world is actually going through the second wave. And some of those regions, like as you see in different regions of the world, of the WHO, there are some very strong peaks which are coming up, particularly in the Southeast Asia region and the Eastern Mediterranean region and the Western Pacific region. So this becomes, a, this, is, this is definitely of major concern for all of us. Now, when you look at it, what has been the response from our side, from the, from the global uh, response to this? We have got multiple vaccines coming up with multiple platforms. And as of this morning, like if you see, we, we know that more than 70, more than 792 million doses have been administered. And of course, small countries, like if you look at Israel and Bhutan, they have been able to give at least more than 60% of their population, at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. So now we have the pandemic, we have the vaccines which are being given. Now then comes up this question, this particular question. This vaccine is, is actually coming up under a little bit of a different circumstances. And therefore, the safety issues must be different. So the answer is to some, to a large extent, yes, but we are right now in a position where we are actually responding to it accordingly. Now let us see what is the difference between the conventional uh, vaccine development and the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development. What actually is the difference? So if you see, normally if you see your vaccine development, I would like to draw your attention to the bottom of the screen. It normal vaccine development goes through a long drawn out process. Sometimes it can take as much as, let us say 20 years. In fact, some of the vaccines, it goes even beyond that. So if, whereas if you look at the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, the vaccine has actually been made at a record time interval of less than a one year. And that too, not just one type of vaccine, but different vaccines coming out from different platforms. And so there are some safety implications connected to that. And we need to really look at it from that perspective as well. So normally, if you see, you have three phases, okay? The first phase is actually the when, you, when, you, when a vaccine is developed. The first phase is actually the preclinical testing phase. Now, what happens here? This is the phase where you know the molecule or the antigen, which is used to, to which goes into the vaccine, that is the one, the raw element which actually mounts the immune response, is actually going into the vaccine. So that is what we call as the antigen. Now, mind you, it is not enough to have just the antigen, but along with the antigen, like one example of the antigen would be that you know the, the mRNA molecule, which goes into your Pfizer vaccine as well as into your uh, into your Moderna vaccine, for example. Now, it is not enough to just have that mRNA there, but it has to go with a with a with a lipid envelope. It has to go with it. So we need to make sure that even the lipid envelope is also safe. And then it, is, it has to be very clear. First of all, it has to be developed and it also has to be tested for safety. So first of all, those kind of testings go in for use animal models, and then you enter into the phase of clinical testing. Now, when you, when you enter into the phase of clinical testing, there are three phases. The phase one clinical trials is when they test it in, you know, normally it is done in small groups of about 10 to 40 volunteers. And usually what happens is it is not at the risk population. And of course it is at the risk population, but it is usually healthy adults who usually get this particular vaccine. So this is where they look for two things, whether this vaccine is safe and also they would like to know whether the vaccine is effective. And primarily in phase one, they look for safety. Now, the next thing which you look at is your phase two clinical trials, where you know you can increase the sample size to from, uh, from 10 to uh, uh, 40 or less than 100, sometimes hundreds to, 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 uh, to, a, to a few hundreds, actually it is done, phase two clinical trials. Now, this is, this is also done in an at-risk population, but at that time they tried to find out whether the population which is getting this, they look at the dose, they like to find out which is the most optimal dose. 
And phase three clinical trials, they usually do it for large populations, several thousands of vaccines, of doses. Usually, like if you see vaccines, like, you know, the Moderna vaccine or your Pfizer vaccine, they have done it in somewhere from 35,000 to 40,000 and even AstraZeneca, like 60,000 doses. So once this is cleared, the clinical trial phase three, this is this dotted line here is a very important dotted line. This is where for COVID, the vaccines have been given right now what they call as an EUA, that is emergency use authorization, which means there is permission to be used in, in the general population with some strict preconditions. So that is where we go into the phase four. And this is the stage where I am going to be discussing everything today and how each of us have an important role to play in, in monitoring the safety of this COVID vaccine. So this is what I'm going to be focusing on. Now, so as I said just now, we are going to be looking at it from two, two, two uh, perspectives. What about before it enters into the market? That is what is going to happen here and what, what is going to happen here. That is the pre-market uh, pre entry, pre-approval phase and the post-approval phase. So in the pre-approval phase, what happens from the safety perspective? As I just mentioned, there is rigorous safety testing during the clinical trials. So there is lab testing, which is done to ensure that it is vaccine is of good quality. They undergo clinical trials, uh, non-clinical studies to rule out toxicity. And as I said, you know, they give it in human beings to test it. They look at two things, the safety and the efficacy. The biggest problem with this particular issue, when you even in spite of highest quality clinical trials, the biggest challenge we actually face is, the, is this, even if you do it in large sample sizes, like even 60,000 people, we will not be able to detect rare adverse events. For instance, the occurrence of rare adverse events like anaphylaxis, even among traditional vaccines, like your measles vaccine, is like one in about one to one or two million doses of vaccines. If you look at even vaccines like polio vaccines, the occurrence of a vaccine like vaccine associated paralytic polio is about two per two million dose, one to two per million doses. So these are the kind of rates which we are talking about. So this cannot be detected during clinical trials. And that is exactly the problem we are facing today with the COVID vaccines also, because it is being given to huge populations of which is runs into millions of population out after just clinical trials in smaller number of subjects. The other thing which also happens is these subjects here, these people here who are there in this last box, you should understand the clinical trials are just over, you know, the phase three clinical trials are over, but we really don't have an idea on how the, the vaccine is going to be performing, like, let us say two years from now, or even one year from now. So even the clinical trial participants who actually participated in the earlier studies, they also have to be followed up for long-term effects. So this is something you have to keep in mind. Now, so I finished what happens before the vaccine enters into the market. Now let us see what happens when the vaccine enters into the market and it starts getting used for people like you and me. Now, it is very important that safety monitoring after approval takes place. It's very, very important because particularly for identifying unrecognized events, that's important. So how does, how do we get this data? Once it enters into the market, how do we get this data? What we do is we have something, the, the first bullet here, it involves analysis of reports of suspected adverse events from patients through a passive reporting mechanism. This is what we call as in, in technical terms as spontaneous reporting. That is people like us will go and uh, ordinary uh, people like us will go and then report it into a system which is established by the government. A typical example would be like the WARES, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which is present in the United States where anyone can report those systems. You also have something called, so this is one way of reporting. There are certain systems called active surveillance systems within the countries. What is the meaning of that? So what happens is during clinical trials, sometimes what happens is people tell us, the manufacturer will come back and tell, you know what, when we did this clinical trial, we found that there was higher occurrence of a condition like Bell's palsy or a facial nerve paralysis. So what we do is from our side, we will be putting something called a risk management plan. And we tell the countries, 
be careful this is something which which could occur so be very careful so in those cases what we do is we we establish active surveillance systems in the countries to be on the lookout for certain unusual events in addition to that there are certain safety studies conducted by vaccine manufacturers and also research studies there are specific research studies when it is used in real life in fact if you look at covid there are thousands of research studies which are going on with covid vaccines and also the last bullet which is also very very important is that you know the regulators now who are the regulators the regulators are the people who give who who clear the use of the vaccines these are expert pharmacologists epidemiologists who you know review the documents supplied by the manufacturer review those documents and say okay they and they would be discussing with the ministry of health and saying this vaccine can be used in this particular country so they also will be having information coming from all over the world and that information is shared okay so now i have i have told you what happens before the vaccine uh, first enters into the market and i'm now telling you what happens in general after the vaccine enters into the market now it let us look at it from a personal perspective like i am an individual who may be a person who a lay person or i might even be a doctor or a nurse or i can be a taxi driver or something and what is happening is i am having an adverse event now what is what am i going to be doing about it now when you go the first stage i'll be i'll be talking about that in detail a little bit in the next slide also i'm going to be touching upon it but remember the basic thing which you need to report is through to report this thing through something known as an adverse event following immunization reporting form or an aefi reporting form so what you see here in this green box here is an aefi reporting form so how do i get this form it's very simple just go to google and type aefi reporting form it's enough the who reporting form will be generated in a in a pdf format you just fill up a piece of paper so how does it how does it get filled up there it can be a paper reporting form which you can use like just a piece of paper do download it and fill it up or many of the countries have now got electronic database systems so ma many of the times when you go and meet a doctor and all these people the, the at that the doctor or the person who's looking at this particular uh, looking at you will be filling up an electronic database and this electronic database will then go to a district level program manager so the district so it reaches the district headquarters where they uh, usually we have something like the district epi immunization program manager expanded program on immunization manager this gentleman or lady will be reviewing the document cleaning the data and then he has to make a decision whether this particular case which got reported was serious enough for investigation i'll be explaining that in a minute then this data which is collected at the district level is in almost all districts there are electronic methods by which it is uploaded into a database and when it is uploaded into the database it is transmitted to the province and there it is looked at by the province epi manager at the district surveillance system and usually the regulatory authority sitting at the province level so they will be reviewing this particular data and then they will also be the data is usually transmitted in real time many of the times you find that the data from the district goes and sits into the national database in real time so the pro some places it may come from the district to the province the province might clear it and then it goes into the national database so when it reaches the national and the national database at the national capital usually there are two groups of people who look at the data the immunization program and the national regulatory authority the nash in addition to the data which is obtained from the periphery the national regulatory authority also gets information from the manufacturers telling them that be careful these are the other what other countries reported about the adverse events and then this particular data is then shared between the epi program and the regulators and this data is then shared it is undergoes something called a data transformation now what is the meaning of that in simple english it means it is encrypted the data is encrypted and then it is transmitted into the global level into the global database okay so this is encrypted and what the encryptation format it is not e28 it is actually called e2b format 
and it is it is encrypted in an E2B format, and then it is transmitted into the global database into a place in Sweden, which is known as Uppsala Monitoring Center. And then from there, it comes into the WHO. So the manufacturers also send independent data to WHO, and the WHO then shares this data with relevant committees. Okay. Now this is now why you can ask me why is why am I spending so much time trying to tell this? This is very very important because right now I want to highlight a very important point. This kind of data we are getting information from European countries. Japan and a few developed countries and also from the United States and Canada and, and the developed countries. But even though the COVID vaccine is used all over the world, the amount of information coming from developing countries is hardly anything. And today, in fact, the recommendations which I'm going to be showing, sharing with you, Base is uh, which is which came up last week from the Global Advisory Committee is primarily based on European data as well as data available in the United States and also other regulators in high income countries. Now, this is important. Why is this important? Because if the vaccines used in these countries are completely different from the vaccines used in other countries, in and if this data from other countries is not shared. We are, WHO is not in a position to give you evidence-based decisions on what is happening with other vaccines. Frankly, we don't know. So this is where we are standing. And that is exactly the reason why I'm spending some time trying to tell you why it is important for transmitting, collecting this reporting form and transmitting data to the global database. Okay, now I'm coming to a little bit more granular level. I'm coming to a very a bit more granular level. That is, how do how does vaccine safety monitoring detect adverse events? So when you look at it in terms of an adverse event, it is you know an adverse event following immunization can be any unintended sign, lab finding, symptom, or disease. It sounds very uh, complicated, but I'll just try to tell you in simple words. What is a sign? If a patient comes to us with a complaint, if a doctor, and by examining it, if the doctor will find out, oh, a lymph node is enlarged, I find an enlarged liver. When I, when I listen to with a stethoscope, I find something in the heart or in the lung, that is a sign. So when you look at an abnormal lab finding, it is like, you know, an, a CT scan is taken, an X-ray is taken, an ECG is taken, blood is taken, so you find that as a lab finding. Symptom is what a patient complains, like I have got itching, I have got uh, uh, rashes, so those is what it is. And a disease would be something like, you know, meningitis, maybe something like that. Now, the presence of sometimes, you know, the why I'm trying to highlight this is people tell us, come back and say, you know what, after I got the vaccine, the patient died. So that is an adverse event. No, we will not be willing to accept that as an adverse event. The death is actually an outcome. It is not an, it is not considered as an AEFI. Because what happens is there will always be an underlying cause of death, like, you know, maybe a ruptured aneurysm, a thrombosis, a pneumonia or something like that. So that is an adverse event. So this is something which you have to keep in mind. And just because you report an adverse event, it doesn't mean the vaccine caused the event. You have to do something known as causality assessment. And how is that done? So when at the time of your vaccination, you are informed, usually the, the health worker who vaccinates you or the, or the doctor or the nurse will tell you, okay, by the way, this vaccine can cause these, please expect today evening you to have some fatigue, to have pain at injection site. Please expect some kind of complications after one week, like that they will tell you. Now, so that is, so what happens is the when you go back home, you are also mentally prepared for that. Now, when you go back home, the, the event can take place or may not take place. The first stage when it occurs is the stage where the event is detected. And if once the event is detected, it is detected either by the patient or, a, or the recipient himself, or it could be detected by the treating physician, sometimes by a bystander, by a relative, it can be by anyone. Now, the event which is first thus detected is then brought to the notice of the health system. This is bringing it to the notice of the health system. And that is what we call as notification. The next stage is a stage of reporting. Now, if you just look at it, health workers, you know, people like this, 
either a health worker or a nurse or a doctor will fill up the reporting form what i just told you so that is what we call as a reporting now just because a case gets reported it does not mean that it will get investigated there is a group of people who sit there and decide is it really a serious case what is the meaning of the word serious has it caused a death has it caused a disability has it caused a congenital anomaly has was it life threatening or is it a medically significant event only in those cases will it be investigated now there is also a stage where the data is analyzed you know the case which the reports which are collected here by these people goes into that i told you about the district level i told you about the province level and i also told you about the national level the data from here in the reports are actually analyzed and people do a huge amount of analysis let me tell you honestly i have been very impressed with the kind of analysis which is done in many countries okay and then these this analysis is then fed into a committee which then tries to decide the costs okay i am also going to be explaining in detail on what basis will this committee take a decision on how this is done so this is how this causality assessment is done now i'm introducing a new word here okay this last bullet this bullet number 4 is actually a new new word it is an adverse event of special interest what is this this has never been heard before in covid it was not there it was there all right but what kind of covid brought this up it really got um, uh, you know emphasized this particular event an adverse event of special interest is a pre specified medically significant event that has the potential to be causally associated with the vaccine product that needs to be carefully monitored and confirmed by further special studies one of the typical examples is this thrombotic thromboembolic manifestations which we hear about so much so that is actually an adverse event of special interest because we are beginning to get this kind of reports it was not originally reported by the company or anybody it has been it has been highlighted as events so which has been which has now we have got a case definition and all that and then we will be following up these particular events okay so now so i have just told you this one now let's go to the how is this assessment done i just came here i'll just tell you on what basis will this committee take a call how will this particular committee take a call on doing a causality assessment so there are actually established analysis techniques now you can ask me where will you get that it's very very simple all you need to do is just go to google just type aefi causality assessment you will get two things one is you will get a manual and i think there is a link to that at the end of this uh, slide set you will also be able to get in addition to that you will also be able to get a link to a software we are who has actually developed a causality assessment software which will help uh, countries to do this assessment and not only that generate a pdf report which they can very clearly document it so there are standard established analysis techniques which are available to do this causality assessment so then a systematic approach is is taken and usually the committee decides the final causality based on the post marketing safety monitoring that is what i told you earlier about the spontaneous reporting it they also take a call based on other studies which have been uh, which are there and also information from regulators worldwide and also from medical literature this is what is done now supposing if this analysis concludes that a new event is caused by a vaccine then you need to take action action is actually taken and this includes one of the uh, things which, which is done is actually listing the adverse event on the vac on the vaccine package insert or a medical alert is actually issued so this is what is done now i have come to the last part of my talk and from now on i'm going into enter into some complicated stuff which i will try to simplify okay so what am i going to be telling you in the next few minutes i'm just telling you about a particular committee sitting at the global level in fact this committee was established towards the end of last year specially for covid okay this the committee i'm sorry not this committee there was a sub committee this committee was established in the in the late 1990s this is the global advisory committee on vaccine safety is a group of experts that provide independent guidance on vaccine safety issues which is of global importance to who and this sub committee what i was exactly what i was just talking to you about now was established like towards based on for the covid it was established towards the, in uh, december last year 
And uh, this was mainly to assess the latest safety data on COVID-19 vaccines. We have weekly meetings, sometimes in some weeks, there are even more than one meeting, depending on the, the evidence which is available and the need for having these meetings. You know, So sometimes we have more than one meeting uh, every week. So I'm going, to, since we are talking about this AstraZeneca issues and safety issues, I'm just going to be focusing on what happened, what were the deliberations which took place in this GACS meeting on the 13th of April and what was the outcomes and what are the implications of this particular uh, uh, thing? Because I think people are really keen on listening to this. So what were the observations of this meeting which took place on the 13th of April? So a very rare new type of events of adverse event called thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome involving an unusual and severe blood clotting events associated with low platelet count has been reported after vaccination with COVID-19 vaccines, Vaxivira and Covishield. So I know this is very technical. I'm going to just convert it into simple English. So what, what, uh, what was the first observation was that there were a, a, a rare, very rare new type of adverse event which is called thrombosis. Thrombosis is actually clotting. So blood is actually forming clots with thrombocytopenia syndrome. What is the meaning of that? You know, the thrombocyte, thromb, thrombocytes means platelets. It's another term for the word platelets. Usually we have a platelet count of about 150,000 to about 450,000 per ml of the blood. Now what happens in thrombocytopenia is the value comes below 150,000. Usually there is not much of a problem. You know, when the, when the value starts coming down, you know, when it comes less than 100,000, when it comes lesser than that, the platelets are the, are the data, are, you know, the components of the blood, which are responsible for clotting, for blood clotting. So if the, if the platelet count keeps coming down, like the, the word thrombocytopenia, if the platelet count keeps coming down, then there is a tendency for bleeding. Okay, so there is, there is a tendency for bleeding. So, but what, what was very peculiar about this was, it was connected with both thrombosis, that is there was clotting, at the same time, there was also platelets which were actually coming down. So this was reported after these particular vaccines. So they also noticed that this thrombosis or this clotting was occurring in specific sites, you know, just like the brain and abdomen. This appears to be the key feature of this new syndrome called the TTS, which is something we have to keep in mind. Now, you know, when you look at the third bullet here, data from the UK suggests that the risk is approximately four cases per million adults or one case for 250,000 population who received the vaccine, while the rate is estimated to be about one per 100,000 in the European Union. Now, when you go and look into the literature, when you start searching, even today, like even if you go and then look into the net, you'll be finding multiple people giving you multiple reports. Now, why is that? There is a reason for that, because when you look at this, you need to go with something known as the case definitions. If you take certain components and you miss out certain components of this of the thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome, you are likely to get different rates. Let me give you an example. For instance, one of the things which is commonly reported in the media is something called the CVST, cerebral venous sinuses. You know, in the, the brain, has in the brain there are some places where you know the the veins are there. It is actually called the venous sinuses. So if the clots are occurring in those venous sinuses, that is the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So in in those, if you just take only those values, the rates are completely different from when you include other things like, for instance, what's happening in the lungs, like pulmonary embolism, what is happening in the in the abdomen, like you know the splanchnic vein thrombosis. If you take into account your deep vein thrombosis of your leg, so so the, of your limbs, so these kind of things becomes a bit of a problem. So that is why when you look at the numbers, please be careful to see. What are the source of your numbers before you can interpret that data? That is something you have to keep in mind. Now, I also want to highlight that as this particular data was presented on the 13th of uh, April, and at that particular point in time, this TTS syndrome has not been linked with mRNA vaccines such as Comirnaty and Moderna vaccines, mRNA vaccine. Now, please remember, if you go into the, if you look into the literature, this, you, it, we are still beginning to get information that there could be links, but we have, but again, 
we need to really go more, get more information, dig into more details and find out whether the, the cases are there all right, but is there really an association? So there is a large amount of statistical tests and things like that to be done to either prove or disprove that, particularly for other vaccines, which are mRNA vaccines. Now, I want to also highlight this last bullet, which is very, very important, okay? And I want to highlight the fact that we, WHO, as I mentioned, we are getting information from developed countries. Uh, we get information about the Pfizer vaccine, we get information about, about the Moderna vaccine, the, the j and &J vaccine, we get information about the AstraZeneca vaccine, but we don't have information, sufficient information. We do have some information, but we do not have sufficient information on vaccines which are made by other countries and which are used in many other parts of the world which we know vaccines are made, are made by China, which is used in several countries, vaccines made by Russia, used in several countries. But right now, the system which is there is not able, which we are, which was used, what I showed you, the WHO Global Database does not have sufficient data to really interpret the amount of information collected from these systems. Okay, now what is its implication? So this is the observations, what, we, what was observed. Now, what is its implications from particularly for clinicians and care providers? So clinicians should be alert to any new severe persistent headache or, or significant symptoms such as severe abdominal pain, shortness of, shortness of breath with an onset of four to 20 days after this uh, adenovirus vectored vaccines. Okay, because it is not only seen uh, in AstraZeneca, but I think all of you must have also seen the news about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is also using the same platform for which the US FDA has, you know, paused the vaccination for a short time, temporarily. So this is something you have to keep in mind, right? Now, we, the manifestation need not be only just headache. You can even get other conditions like, you know, blurring of vision you can get. You can get sometimes one part of, I mean, a weakness in a particular limb. When you look at, uh, you know, abdominal pain, epigastric pain, nausea, you can get uh, breathlessness, etc. You can still get. So what, what are we recommending? So countries should encourage clinicians to measure the platelet levels and conduct appropriate radiological imaging studies as a part of the investigation of the thrombosis. Example would be like if, if you have the capacity to do a test like, you know, MRI or MRV, so some kind of uh, high uh, tests if, if the capacity permits, otherwise the, each country, of course, is in variable capacity. Clinicians should, this is the last point, which is extremely, extremely important. You know, clinicians should be aware that although heparin is used to use blood, is used to treat blood clots in general, administration of heparin in these conditions of TTS may be dangerous and alternative treatments such as immunoglobulins and non-heparin anticoagulants should be considered. So this is something which you have to keep in mind, okay? You cannot use, usually everyone uses heparin to, to, to treat these conditions, but you cannot use this for treatment because that itself can kill. So you will have to keep that in mind. So for countries, so, so I've told you what is the implications for clinicians. Now let's look at the implications for countries. Now, this countries, now, you know, countries will have to make this decision. I'm sitting as a program manager. I need to take a call. Can I use this vaccine? Can I not use this vaccine? How should, how should I make those decisions? So what, what, is, what is GACS recommending? Countries assessing the risk of TTS following COVID-19 vaccination should perform a benefit risk analysis that takes into account local epidemiology, including incidence and mortality from the COVID-19 disease, age groups for target vaccination and availability of alternate vaccines. Now, you know, it looks very complicated, but let me give you a nice example, which I picked up from the net from the government from the UK, which was very nicely done, I thought. So let me just uh, uh, go there. I'll just open up the site. So what happens is all you need to do is you just come here. You need to look at, you know, you need to weigh the risk versus benefits. You need to know whether you are at, first of all, we need to know whether you are a high risk, low risk individual, or whether you are a high risk individual, or a moderate risk, a medium risk individual, or a high risk individual, okay? And then what you need to do is you look at the, the potential harm based on the age group. And then what are the potential benefits? What are the benefits? How many amount of ICU admissions are prevented as a result of vaccination? So based on that, you can actually calculate 
based on that depending on country by country estimate which is the which is the benefit and which is the risk so this is just an example and the link is there so when it is shared with you you will be able to access that so that needs to be done Con country should review investigate all cases of uh, tts following uh, covid-19 vaccination and then they should be using and using a particular case definition called the brighton collaboration case definition i'll be explaining that in the next slide okay and it's very very important to provide local authorities and who individual case safety reports you know the the documentation of those cases should be done now also one more important point is we are suspecting that there is a possibility of geographic variation so what you are seeing in the form of the thrombotic thromboembolic manifestations might be present in europe but we really don't know whether depending on the population's genetic makeup whether it will be the same thing would be seen in other parts of the world for instance i do know for instance there is something like the mediterranean thrombo uh, uh, thrombocytopenia and other conditions which will occur in certain populations which will not be present in other populations so we don't really know whether this particular thrombosis and thromboembolic manifestations are actually unique to certain part populations or is it homogeneous throughout the world and that is also one more reason why we need additional data to to you know make informed decisions so one the other thing is also we need to also communicate about about this about it to the community to maintain trust so what next so this is a specific case definition is being developed by brighton collaboration i'm glad to inform you that it is ready so if you just click on this bullet here it will take you to the brighton collaboration definition for for tts so it is ready to be used we got it only on the 16 that is last friday it was ready the biological mechanism is being investigated and at this stage a platform specific mechanism that is whether it is an adeno we know that it is an adenovirus platform and whether it is an adenovirus platform which is responsible for it we don't really know so this is further studies are actually required for that and then we should also we should review the further research to include all vaccines and not just only adenovirus vectored vaccines should be should be also planned and people are actually planning for that gax also recommends that we should be looking at further studies particularly to look at it based age specific rates particularly to study about age specific rates and also sex related risks because initially when you look at the data which we have received it looks like the tendency is that more females are affected compared to males but on a closer look you will find particularly in europe and all that many of the people who got vaccinated were health workers and many of them were actually female but there are cases which are reported in males as well so we cannot really draw a conclusion based on just a few a uh, few reports so this is my last slide okay make sure that you need to inform the public about the suspected adverse events you need to make sure that you report that uh, uh, and listen to the media and other communities to understand the main questions and concerns and any associated rumors this is important and also communicate clearly proactively don't wait for people to ask questions on the other hand try to put it up front tell them very frankly and transparently this is what we are actually seeing do it early do it through trusted people like you know the spokespersons and also make sure that you actually demonstrate competence in science systems and the program with empathy honesty and transparency but do not over reassure do not say oh it's very safe don't worry and all that but explain the facts to them and allow people to make informed choices and decisions okay and also make sure you connect to your networks your friends in communicate this particular message identify and engage all influencers advocates and other champions who will be able to answer questions and also provide the context so this is the additional resources available this is a beautiful book if you get a chance on causality assessment this is the who manual on vaccine safety surveillance you if you click on this all training materials are also available there is so much amount of information available in the who website so we welcome you to come back and use it thank you very much back to you sir Thank you very much, um, Dr. Madhav, for a very comprehensive and um, informative presentation. There have been a lot of comments in the chat um, saying just that, so I think it's very much appreciated by all the listeners here today. We've got a lot of questions that have come through, so um, we will try and get to those immediately now. 
Um, unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to get through them all, but let's see how we go. One question. Uh, Sarah, just um, a minute, let me get a pen. Let me just take, get a pen. Okay, sure, no problem. Yes, please, go ahead. Sure, if you want to stop sharing your slide, then people can see your face in the full screen. And um, <laughs> great, thank you. So the first question um, came in really uh, alludes to that need for, for more data. Uh, this participant uh, says, I'm interested to learn more about how to monitor um, safety of COVID-19 vaccines in resource limited settings, as I have seen little to no information is given to vaccine recipients on how to monitor or report concerns. Do you have any comments on that? Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, that's a very nice question, you know, because people always talk about, uh, you know, high income settings where, you know, things are looking very rosy. So how exactly are we going to be managing this in resource limited settings? Now, if you just look at that last link, which I sent to, which, which was there in the last slide, there is a vaccine safety surveillance manual, which has been developed by WHO, which is available in the public domain. And if you just see this, uh, the, it just gives you all the information. And primarily, we have tried our best to tailor make it to the low and middle income countries settings. Now, you should understand that in each country, we can, from the WHO perspective, we will be able to provide you with the, with the general content, including the guidelines. I'm talking about the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine safety specific guidelines have, have been rolled out in several countries. Now, from our side, our the officers, the WHO has got offices in six WHO regions and also in several countries. So those, those people will be able to guide you specifically as to how to tailor make these guidelines to be suited to the local country context and even more into the local context. I hope I've answered that question. Thank you very much. Another question um, related to the uh, reporting of the, the blood clots with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Have um, there been any studies done to compare the rates or the increased risk of rates of clots in vaccinated people compared to those in non-vaccinated people of similar age and with other characteristics? That's so a fantastic that. question. Very nice. Thank you. Whoever asked this question, excellent. So you know what we are, uh, as I was mentioning now, and also as was mentioned in the Global Advisory Committee, uh, come up as one of the recommendations we are who is uh, in the threshold of uh, we would be developing uh, what we call as uh, uh, you know active avss active vaccine safety surveillance there are two methods by which we normally do one is actually through something known as the cem or the cohort event monitoring that is we follow up people who are vaccinated over a period of time and try to find out the occurrence of this events we also do another thing known as a sentinel site surveillance where you know we go into different institutions and then look back retrospectively into data or even prospectively into data and then through in particular sentinel sites where people come for their particular for, for treatment for these unique conditions now from our side in fact we have already got the protocols and all uh, quite ready but now with the gaps recommendation which is coming up we would be in a process to just start off that work very soon uh, based on the level of interest in countries and for this we definitely need countries to come forward and say that they are interested in doing these particular studies and if countries are interested they need to contact we request them to contact the who country offices and tell them that we our country would like to do this particular study and uh, the request for support. From our side, we will not only be, we'll be able to provide you two, two types of support, we will be able to provide you the technical support on how to create the protocols. We'll also be able to give you guidance on how to collect this data using electronic database systems, and then how to interpret that particular data through a very scientific method. But as such, honestly, up to now, we haven't conducted any studies because this information came up only last week. Thanks. Thanks very much um, for your response. Another question um, came out related to the blood clotting events. Can a prophylactic dose of aspirin be given to all those above 50 or 60 years? Would this help? The age cutoff can be decided based on the data available for beneficiaries who died probably due to blood clotting. 
even after vaccination with one of these two events? Thank you for this question, because uh, from what I understood, I, I actually had a discussion with uh, some of the hematologists recently. So one thing which they are saying is actually we should not be using drugs like aspirin as a prophylactic measure. But on the other hand, uh, before vaccination, on the other hand, you know, using, uh, you know, methods like screening methods, like, you know, methods for screening uh, patients. And I, I showed you how this can be done, identifying high risk people. And then if their people are at high risk, explain the risk to them, and then also explain the benefits to them, and then allow them to make an informed choice, including the presence of, a, of an alternative vaccine. So these things need to be considered when we are actually vaccinating. Thanks. Thank you very much. A question from Karen. How do the risk factors, such as the blood clots that have been reported, compare to accepted levels of risks with other vaccinations, such as annual influenza vaccine programs or rubella or measles? Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, this is also quite an important question because when you look at the risk of this, uh, uh, there has been a recent publication which has indicated that the risk is actually, if you just look at this uh, uh, of the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis in the general population, if, if without any vaccine at all, if you just look at it uh, in, the, in the total population without actually any vaccination, you will be finding that the incidence is about 0.5 per 100,000 population per year. So supposing if this COVID-19, if you look at the disease itself, like people who are having COVID-19, the incidence is 4.5 to 20 per 100,000. With pregnancy, it is a, because if pregnancy, it is a hypercoagulable state, and therefore you get approximately about 10 to 12 per uh, 100,000 deliveries. With similarly, with OCPs, you get about 2.7 to 40, and with J and J vaccine, you get 0.09 per million doses and all that. So the thing which we should, uh, sorry, 0.09 per 100,000 uh, doses. Now, uh, so we should remember with influenza vaccines also we get it, we, we do have reports which are reported, but they are not as high as what you have actually uh, see with uh, if, the, if the people are not, uh, I mean, compared to what happens with COVID, with COVID disease per se. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, another question that's come through. Are there any expected interactions that may arise by the administration of two or more doses from different types of vaccines against COVID? Thank you very much. We were kind of, I was kind of anticipating this question to come up because it's a very common question and people keep asking us, asking the same question all the time. You know, the thing which, which comes up here is like we get asked this question about uh, I gave the first dose of AstraZeneca. Should I continue with, when I give the second dose, can I go for a different vaccine? You know, honestly, this particular question was, was put up to the SAGE last week. Uh, and the, you know, we have a strategic advisory group of experts. And uh, the, the thing is, there is a, a lot of deliberation going on on how the decision will have to be made because some of the countries have actually chosen to continue with the same vaccines, whereas some countries have chosen not to choose the, go for the same vaccines, but the WHO position will be known approximately this week. Thank you very much for the answer. There have been a couple of questions that have come in about the Sinovac and Sinopharm vaccines. So uh, people are aware that WHO is reviewing the data to see whether they can grant emergency use listing for these vaccines. Um, folks are wondering, um, is there a timeline for that? Because it seems to be taking a while. Uh, right. But, you know, the, uh, the thing is, as I mentioned, in WHO itself, there is a process by which uh, the, the data is actually reviewed. It is done in a very, very scientific manner. We have a pre-qualification team, the WHO pre-qualification team, which goes through all the documentation. And uh, once that is reviewed, it is then presented to the SAGE. And once the SAGE approves the whole thing, that is when you will be getting a final approval. Great, thank you for your answer. Could you uh, reiterate uh, what the age risk is with the AstraZeneca vaccine? Right, so based on the information which we are having right now, as we look at it, as I just mentioned right now, many of the, and if you just look at the website, which has actually come in, 
it is it seems to be occurring much more among the younger individuals particularly below 50 years of age it seems to be occurring like between people usually between 30 years to 50 years are the people who seem to be at highest risk and also as i said even though it is not yet confirmed there seems to be more amount of women who seem to be affected compared to men so this is the the something which we are actually noticing but as i also mentioned again i would like to reiterate that we need further studies to really confirm uh, to what extent this is true number one number two whether it is applicable to all populations because as i again said this information as i said earlier this information is available from a particular select population from europe so we really need to have further information about other populations before we can take a call Thank you very much, um, Dr. Madhav. I believe that we're almost at time now. And so I really wanted to thank you for taking this hour with us, for giving such a clear explanation to the subject and for answering the questions so readily and transparently. Um, I want to just ask you if you have any final comments before we close the webinar. Uh, uh, thank you, Sarah. No, I mean, uh, one of the important things is, uh, I just want to mention to the entire audience that WHO takes dis informed dis uh, evidence-based decisions, and that is based on information provided by member states. And it's important for member states to provide information to us so that, you know, like, you know, we still have a lot of unanswered questions with regard to this uh, TT, uh, the thrombosis, uh, thrombocytopenia syndrome. And uh, if uh, further information, uh, if WHO is able to provide quality information, we critically depend on data provided and information provided by member states, whom we would really like to thank for the great and the phenomenal support they have offered us throughout this particular pandemic, particularly. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And so as a final uh, comment, everybody who's listening, um, you can find the recording on YouTube and we will be sharing uh, the presentation with all those who have been uh, who registered over email. So thank you again, Dr. Madhav, and thank you to everybody who's joined us from all around the world today. And um, we wish you a safe and happy rest of the day. Bye bye. Bye bye.